Today, I'm speaking with David Burkus. David just released uh, a book called Leading from Anywhere, The Essential Guide to Managing Remote Teams. He's full of ideas, uh, very concrete stuff that we can apply in our business. I'm delighted to be speaking with him, and I'm sure you're going to enjoy it as well. Hello, and welcome to a new episode of the Business of Meeting podcast. I am absolutely delighted today to welcome a great friend, a great mind, somebody, I shouldn't say that because then uh, he's going to hold me accountable for this, but he's one of the clever person I know. Uh, and no, I, I only know three people. No, no. David Burke is, is absolutely amazing. I could have told you that he has a master degree in organizational psychology from the University of Oklahoma. I could have told you about his doctorate in strategic leadership from Regent University or that he's been on all the media from Fast Company to uh, Harvard Business Review, the Wall Street Journal, CNN, BBC, CBS. I could have even tell you that his TED Talk has been seen by 2 million people. But the best way I can introduce David Burkus is that he's an amazing human being. Uh, he's a great mind. And he's a wonderful teacher of jujitsu, which is exactly how I met him. David, thank you for taking the time. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. That really, that really was it, right? Yeah, you went to the workout that we did in Park City. <laughs> um, and I hadn't met you at that conference yet. Um, True. To, to date, the weirdest sort of extracurricular conference activity I've ever seen in any meeting. I'm, I'm really glad they let us roll the dice on that one. And it, it worked out really well. It was awesome because uh, for, for those listening um, and, and those who know me, uh, I like Krav Maga. I've never done uh, Jiu Jitsu. And so there was the opportunity to do that. And I was actually uh, training with uh, Nikola Kuzmich at one stage uh, that you were uh, indicating to us what to do. And I almost got to his eyes with my hands. And then we look at each other. He goes, Krav Maga? I say, oh, you too. <laughs> Amazing. So today is a big day because today you're releasing Leading from Anywhere, the Essential Guide to Man Managing Remote Teams. Yeah, yeah, it's exciting. It's been a kind of a crazy uh, journey. It's certainly, uh, I went into 2020 not knowing that that would be the end result book that we ended up writing. Uh, but I think most people went into 2020 with wildly different plans than what ended up happening. So, you know, in in the end, I think it worked out uh, worked out pretty well. Absolutely. And is it is it what your your fifth book? Depends on how you count. Uh, it's either the fourth or the fifth. Um, so I did in 20. Actually, in the beginning of 2020, we had released uh, a project with Audible um, called Pick a Fight, which was all about how organizations can phrase their purpose in a way that's a little more meaningful. That, that, that it's a little more about what are we working towards, what injustice are we removing from the world, et cetera. Um, and that was, that, honestly, the plan for 2020 was mostly to talk about that book and its effect on how teams get aligned and motivated and, and, how, and all of that. Um, but we released it with Audible and an interesting thing happened to the world of podcasting and audio books in, you know, around March 15th or give or take a day, depending on which of the 190 plus countries you live in, uh, pretty much everyone's commutes stopped. And so audiobook consumption dropped, podcast consumption dropped, and coming out with an audio only product turned out to not be that great of an idea in, in 2020. Um, so if you count that, this is the fifth book. If you don't, this is, uh, this is the fourth. That book's also about half the length because, again, it was geared towards somebody who wants to listen to this on a commute or so within two days commute. You, you got the gist of it. You're, you're down, um, which was a really fun project to do. But again, that was the plan for 2020. And then everyone has a plan until they get punched in the head. And I think all of us collectively, in fact, even in the, in the business of meetings, collectively got punched in the head. And we've all been thinking about what's the best value we can provide to the people that we serve. In my case, it was the readers. And that turned out to be a reframe of a couple projects I was working on ahead of time in this remote context. So writing a book is uh, an exciting uh, undertaking. But in the same time, uh, you, you're working with a publisher, you have deadlines, uh, and, and here you are talking about uh, leading remote teams. Uh, to take us a little bit uh, to the process that you, you had to, uh, to comply with and also the research that you had to do in a very short uh, period of time. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, and, and you're wrong, by the way, writing a book is not exciting. Launching a book is exciting. <laughs> writing a book is agony. Um, 
So this was a project that we started talking about in May. Um, we, I really felt like there was a hole in the marketplace of literature. I'm sure you saw this too, right? So everything kind of the world ended uh, or, or, or tried to end. Um, and everybody, most of the knowledge workers in the world were suddenly remote. Events were canceled. Please don't come into the office, et cetera. Um, and around April, early April, there was this flood of a couple different types of literature, right? There was the how to be productive while you're working from home, which was great and very well needed. And then there was the resurgence of voices who have actually been advocating for remote work for a decade plus, right? And, and these are the people who've been researching companies that are fully distributed um, or and, and basically advocating that more companies should, should do that and should move more of their workforce towards remote. And now the pandemic has sort of accelerated the trend that was already going on. But I felt like there was a big gap in the market, which was, what do you do if, if you didn't ask for any of this and you don't even particularly like it, right? You were managing a team for a multinational organization and then suddenly they told you, congratulations, your whole team is remote. You're not going to see them in person for the next nine months. Good luck. What do you do, right? And so I felt like that question wasn't getting answered in any of the literature. And so that's the question we sought to, to answer. And there is luckily because of those larger, the, the broader remote work movement, there was a lot of research that was already out there. Some of the best studies I've seen conducted on virtual teams were actually conducted four or five years ago when technology was worse and, and making it, uh, doing all of this was harder. Um, so the challenge for me in writing was really more about translating. Here's what we know about these remote work uh, teams, these virtual teams, these boundary list teams, which is sort of the, the cross-functional teams that are put together across business units, continents, languages, et cetera. Um, and then also the research on fully distributed companies, which is something I've been writing about since 2016, but really trying to distill all of that down and going, okay, what does that mean for my team? I lead a team of 12 people. What does that mean for us? We're probably not going to be in this fully distributed world forever, but we're going to be here for a while. And then when we come back, we're going to come back to something that looks a whole lot different than mm -hmm. nine to five, five days a week. So how do I do it in there? And that's that's kind of why we settled on the idea of leading from anywhere. It became obvious to me by June that the future of work is working from anywhere, is a level of flexibility at the office that we have never seen before, where people are, it used to be that flexible work was either reserved for the top 5% of performers or all of the people who got a stigma attached to them because they wanted to balance caretaking and work life, which Never should have happened, and that's a whole other rant we can talk about. But that's the reality of what we're in. Now there's no stigma. Now it's something everybody's been doing for nine months. And when we come back to the office and we ask for, hey, can I still have those Wednesdays and Fridays work from home? You almost can't not say yes to that anymore. So how do you lead that team when you're hybrid, et cetera, when you're working from anywhere? So those are the questions that we really tried to answer in the book, because I think that's where this future of work is headed. And I really didn't see anybody talking about it in April, May, June. And so I decided to. Awesome. And we're going to get in, into the, the content of the book in a minute. Uh, before that, I just have one question. Uh, I know companies, not later than uh, last February, uh, they were um, giving a good improvement to their employees by saying, um, this year you'll be able to work 15 days uh, this year from home. Uh, and by the way, there's a process, you need to request it in advance, blah, blah, blah. Uh, what's going to happen, you think, when, when let's say now that the vaccine is distributed, everybody's fine, uh, um, we can theoretically go back to the office. What do you think is going to be the balance? Can you tell people on one hand, no, you cannot stay home, you have to work in the office, and how many days per week? And in the meantime, to build a culture, to build a culture in the company where, where you need people to come together sometimes. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I will tell you this, you don't send 70 million people in the United States home to work from home for nine months and then go, everybody come back, it doesn't happen. You can try it and there will be companies that try it, but it's not going to work well, right? And so what I think is that 15 number, et cetera, I think we're gonna have to move to something that looks a lot like uh, what was sometimes called the results only work environment, where you as a company need to come up with your rules for what are situations where you actually have to be. So what meetings require attendance versus what meetings require virtual attendance. Um, some companies will go to a core hours strategy, right? So let's say 10 to two every day, we expect you to be at the office, but we really don't care if you're there at eight or if you stay till eight, you know, we, you're flexible inside of that. 
Some companies will go to core days um, and other companies will leave it up to the discretion of the manager. Every single one of them is different, but every single one of them is going to have to do flexibility at a level that they've never done before, not just for top talent, for, but for just about everybody. I mean, the number one, here's the irony, right? The number one response you would get from most senior leaders, BC, before Corona was that remote work doesn't work. My employees, I mean, it, working from home became synonymous with not working, right? Or not being efficient or not being productive or... Right, exactly. And in reality, the opposite was true. Even before Corona, the data suggested the opposite was true. But the, the thing I keep going back to is a study that was actually published in February 2020. So before Corona, technically, right, we were talking about it, everybody was saying that it was, it was, it was just going to be this regional thing, etc., at least here in the West. And there was a study published by Gallup that showed that the optimal level of engagement happened for employees who were at the office two to three days a week, right? So if you're at the office five days a week, you have no, lower no, engagement. Just to make sure that people uh, have heard this, the optimal level of engagement happens if people are in the office for maximum two, three days a week? Yeah. So they basically looked at one day, two day, three day, four day, five day, and, and, base, and then took engagement scores from surveys and sliced the data by how many days a week are you at the office versus from anywhere. And two to three days a week was the max level of engagement. If you're at the office five days a week, you were less engaged or less likely to be engaged. And if you work from home five days a week, you were less likely to be engaged, right? So this isn't a binary thing. Where I think we're headed is a situation where people are going to spend 60, 40 to 60% of their time at the office and the remainder anywhere, not just at home. When Once there's freedom to go anywhere, they'll be anywhere. That's going to have downstream ramifications, right? So you think the, the working from home policy was crazy. Think about what this does to vacation policies, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Because if I'm now responsible for results and I'm working from anywhere, then why should I take vacation days, spend vacation days, when in reality, I can jump on that conference call that was scheduled for 10 a.m. from the beach house that we rented, and then spend the rest of the day, right? And, and when the kids are taking their nap after swimming, I can get the rest of the work done, right? So companies are going to have to rethink that. Um, it's probably going to change some things around dress code, around family life. I, mean, I think there's a lot of flexibility that's going to have to happen downstream to create an environment where the expectation or the norm is people are there two to three days a week as opposed to five days a week. Ah, fascinating. Never thought of that, but that's absolutely true. Now, when you, you were talking about the two or three days per week, I always smile because um, before moving to the U.S., as you know, I was living in Belgium and in France, neighboring country, they passed this law where people need to, to uh, work 35 hours per week. And one of the top CEO in Belgium was interviewed and it was asked, so what do you think about those 35 hours per week? He said, I'm all in favor. I said, really? He said, yes. My weekend would start on Tuesday night. So everybody was <laughs> laughing about that. Now, wh when you consider this new environment that you are describing and makes total sense where people, okay, they might come two, three days a week. Uh, we're reviewing the policy about uh, holidays. Uh, and by the way, that's going to be a nightmare for HR. But oh, yeah. how, how, how do you lead people? How do you lead a team like that? What are the qualities of a, of a leader Uh, and, and how do you lead those teams so that you can still build a culture in the company? Yeah. So let me, let me drill down on that culture piece, because I think that's the really key one. And then we could talk about leadership styles and how do you not come off with a micromanager. But I think this is where everybody needs to be focused um, now. And then if you inherit a remote team moving forward, et cetera, and there's really three pieces of that team culture that you want to be deliberately building right off the bat. Shared understanding, shared identity, and a sense of psychological safety. And each of those things mean three different things. Shared understanding is one of the big ones. Psychological safety is probably the biggest, but shared understanding is big. What it means is that I understand the context that everybody else is working, the preferences that they have, the knowledge, skills, and abilities they have, right? Shared understanding was actually really easy to learn accidentally when we all shared the same kind of area of cubicles or we all shared the same long table in one of those dreaded open offices. When I could chit chat with you on, at the, in the lunchroom, uh, I could learn a lot about your habits, your hobbies. I could hear your pet peeves. I could learn all this stuff that didn't seem all that important, but we filed it away as, oh yeah, you know, Eric was ranting the other day about having to reply to an email at 1130 at night. Mental note, don't email Eric at 1130 at night, right? Those are little things that helped people build cadence when they were actually collaborating. 
that's a lot harder to do in a remote environment. And so we need to take deliberate steps to do it. We need to make sure that people understand uh, each, what each other's calendars are going to be because everybody's are going to be different. The nice thing, really the only nice thing about a 40 hour, nine to five, you know, uh, five days a week type thing is you could guarantee people were working the same schedule, that their schedules were in sync. Right. And that's it, right? Um, that's not all that hard of a thing to overcome. And we've learned that over the last nine months. But um, that you need to overcome it. So you need to build that sense of shared understanding. You also need to build a sense of shared understanding in the context people are working in, right? So we're recording this. I'm lucky enough to have been in, when working really for more than the last nine months, for the last three years, I've been working mostly from home in about a nine by nine room that is in the basement of our house that is quiet. I cannot hear one kid playing Nintendo Switch, which is what he was doing before I came down here, or the other one popping bubble wrap in a different room. I can't hear either of them, right? But other people, when they were sent to work from home, they grabbed a folding screen from a hardware store and stretched it over the corner of their dining room. And you as the leader, but also the whole team needs to know that different people are working in different contexts. So you have a different level of understanding and expectation from those people because stress levels are going to be different. What's feasible for them is going to be different. That's the shared understanding piece. Shared identity speaks to what are the things you're going to do to help bond your team together to feel like a team. I think this is one of the biggest challenges for the anywhere world we're going to be in post-corona, right? Where, where people are two to three days at the office and they're not always going to be the same two to three days is the people that you're in proximity with, even if they're not on your team, are going to be the people you develop relationships with. And you might start getting this us versus them between the co-locateds and the remotes developing, but you as the leader of the team want everybody to be bonded in that purpose, goals, and that sense of this is my team, not who I see every day, but who I'm working on this project with is my team. So the sense that you can build that shared identity. And then the last piece, psychological safety is something we knew was important even before remote mm -hmm. work. Um, I rely on a lot of research here from Amy Edmondson, who's a brilliant researcher. Uh, it speaks to the level of mutual trust and respect that a team has. If I don't feel psychologically safe, if I feel like I'm going to be ridiculed for speaking my mind or suggesting an idea that sounds outside the norm, I'm not going to do it. And so a team gets less of the ability to tap into my knowledge, my skills, my abilities, my creative thinking if I don't feel safe to express myself. Well, in, a, in an in-person environment, it's a little bit easier to build psychological safety or a little bit easier to know when I've accidentally violated it. If I make a joke and I see everyone's facial expressions and I realize that joke didn't land, mm -hmm. I can apologize, right? I can't do that on a Zoom call because I probably can't see everyone as much, right? So I needed to take extra deliberate steps to convey trust and convey respect for what other people are saying to make sure that I'm not being misinterpreted, which is a big problem with text and email-based communication, right? Um, I yep, need to make oh, yeah. sure of all of those things in the service of building a culture where people feel safe to express their whole selves um, because I need them to express their whole selves even louder because we're dealing with these technological communication issues that are not there when we're in person. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that reminds me a story of uh, a, a leader from the UK who was managing a team in Belgium. And uh, during the, the meeting, she asked for different uh, advice, uh, different ideas. And, and one of the, the guys said something and she said, oh, I hear you. Thank you. And she could see his face change. And so she went afterwards and I said, what's going on? I said, nothing. I said, well, obviously, yes. Well, you asked for opinion and then you basically said you don't care. Mm -hmm. She said, when did I say that? When you say you, I hear you. Yeah, I mean it. I hear you. I hear what you said. And the guy took it because... Uh, the context, the language uh, was totally different. So when you're talking yeah. about communication with email, even if it's the same language, th that's uh, a big challenge that uh, <laughs> I went through several times already. Yeah. So we know from research that there is a, that it's not just you. I mean, it, it is. I've emailed with you. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> we know from research that there is a negativity bias in the way most people read email. If something is, read any text message. If it's on the borderline between could be a positive or a negative message, if it's text-based, we're more likely to read it as negative. I think it's actually an expression of loss aversion, right? So we feel greater pain from losing something than we do pleasure from gaining something. So I think that, uh, that affects it. But the point is, we all have that. So when you're composing those messages, you need to be, you need to overemphasize the positive to sort of negate that, right? And I, by the way, I was the same way, not only in 
not only in text communication, but also in, in real life communication. I grew up in the Northeast of the United States, which is a very dry, sarcastic place. I went to high school in Boston where everyone shows love by busting each other's chops, right? Mm-hmm. And then I moved to the South. Um, and it took me a while, for example, and I'm sure you've learned this one for now. It took me a couple of years before I figured out that, oh, bless your heart is actually an insult, <laughs> right? Right. Little little differences like that. And when you're when we start talking about this true sort of work from anywhere team where teams are built around a project and are spanning the globe and spanning different cultures, these things are going to be even more heightened, right? So that psychological safety piece becomes important and it also becomes important to have somebody. I think the one of the roles for the most trusted person on your team as a leader, one of the most important roles for them could be to be your sort of monitor, right? So to say, hey, we're headed into this meeting. We got all 12 people on Zoom. Would you watch me? Would you watch my communication? Would you watch what I say and watch other people and see if there's any areas where I'm misinterpreted? Because it's hard to run a meeting and also catch those things. But if you can appoint someone that you really trust to be that sort of monitor for you, and then you can debrief with her afterwards and, and get that feedback, then you can keep a lot of these things in check and learn and grow over time. And And then, especially if she catches you doing something wrong, you bring it up with the team the next time and you've actually built psychological safety out of your flaw because you were willing to be vulnerable about your mistakes. Right. And that's another point, um, being vulnerable, although I think it's improving over the years, but uh, in a more masculine uh, society was seen as a a weak point. Um, and, And today it's you know, the the more authentic, it's part of the authenticity and to be sometimes vulnerable. And by the way, to apologize, if you make a mistake, there is nothing wrong with that. And people, yeah. I'm not sure that people are still used to that because, or you're on Facebook and life is wonderful and everybody loves it and had the, why do they have such amazing life? Or you're at work and, oh yeah, absolutely. Everything is fine. I'm doing great. And, and people are not always ready to be vulnerable, uh, which post COVID, uh, it's something that hopefully will change because of the mental health issues and because of people needed to to understand better the situation of the people they're working with, don't you think? I hope. I don't know that I think. I hope. I agree with you that that's what needs to happen. And that's what, that's what a smart leader will do. And that's what a lot of high performing teams will do. I'm not a naive optimist. I'm just a regular kind of optimist. And so mm-hmm. I recognize that there will definitely be teams that don't do that. Just like there will be companies that actually attempt to snap their fingers and bring everybody back, right? Right, right. Um, I, I don't think there'll be many of them, but they'll exist. Um, and, you know, as that's okay. That's actually okay because bottom performers, people who don't want, need somewhere to go, right? Right. And top performers will always find their way to that company. So if you want to actually, not not to the bad companies, but to the ones that are doing things smart, top performers find their way there. And this was a message I argued for back in under new management in 2016, is you can keep your company the way it is if you're willing to settle for mediocre engagement, (laughs) mediocre talent, et cetera. But top performers, top talent has always needed organizations less and organizations have needed top talent. They've always had the ability to go somewhere and just get another gig for probably more money or at a company that they enjoy more. And that has never been more true than right now. And it will it will continue to be truer faster. And that's the reason to make these changes. That's the reason to be to care about shared understanding, shared identity, psychological safety. If you want to actually attract that talent in your organization, you need to be paying attention to this. If you don't, if you're comfortable with Michael Scott running your office, then do whatever you want. But yeah. <laughs> so you mentioned about the culture uh, in this new world, share understanding, share identity, psychological safety. I'd like to, to have your, um, your opinion on building bonds, uh, mm-hmm. building bonds remotely, building bonds, building that culture based on that. And my take is any business challenge down the road, there's always a face-to-face meeting. Uh, whether it's it's um, building the culture, training people, going with the customer, uh, aligning teams, you need to bring people. You can do some stuff online, but the 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 bounding, the the creating the unique experience doesn't happen online. And, and that, by the way, that's also what I think that incentive trip and unique experience will come back uh, very strongly afterwards. But how do you how do you build those bonds in, in a world when not everybody's in the office? Yeah. So, so when you look at the data, 
Um, you're you're right and you're wrong. You're right in that it's it's much easier to do, right? In person, doing it in person makes it much easier to do, right? Um, I think the reason it's much more difficult to do virtually is that when we think about virtual, if you think about your average meeting, like let's get the whole company together for for our annual kickoff meeting or the incentive trips or what, what you know whatever you're talking, about. you think about your average meeting. And we sweat the logistics and we pay a little bit of attention to the ambiance and environment. I mean, you and I met at a conference that we go to every year because the conference organizer pays more attention to the ambiance and the environment and the discussion places than to the content, right? Absolutely. But most people don't do that. And, and when everything flipped to virtual, what do you think got left behind when we started thinking about how to make the annual meeting an annual virtual meeting? All of that other stuff. We paid attention to the content, to the logistics, the schedule, the, right? All of that sort of stuff. And we just ignored creating spaces that actually build bonds, right? Um, so that's why I think in person, why there's nothing like that in person. There is something about being face to face and physical, but there's also something about the unstructured moments that happen when everyone's co located that don't happen virtual unless you plan for them. And a lot of smart companies are planning for them. So I see a lot of leaders now, nine months into the pandemic that figured out that one of the best things they can do is start their their weekly all hands meeting five minutes early and leave it open 15 minutes early on the back end so that people recreate the chit chat that they had when they were coming to the staff meeting in person. Um, I see people who are recreating shared meals who are actually taking once a month or once a week and saying, hey, we do lunches together the first Tuesday of every month, right? And, and some companies are even putting the bill for that, which I think is fantastic. So those are little ways you can build bonds. But then also things you can do that encourage people to have one-on-one conversations, actually deliberately scheduled one-on-one conversations, to have coffee breaks with each other, or to schedule office hours where, hey, I'm available for anything you need. You don't have to. This was actually one of my pet peeves about this pivot to the pandemic, if, if I may, is... I kind of figured we'd see a resurgence of the phone call and we didn't. Instead, everyone would send an email to schedule a Zoom call for later that day for 30 minutes for something that would have been solved in a five minute phone call, right? Um, And so I I hope over time we rediscover those kind of, I had a a phone call today that was totally unscheduled and ended up going on for 45 minutes. And we mostly talked about life, not the 15 minutes we needed to talk about something work-related, right? Being deliberate about building those those things will build bonds virtually. I do think when it's safe to gather again, I'm I'm really really bullish on gatherings because I think we're we missed it, and there's a lot of people that are going to want to get back to it. I don't know when that is. I've been wrong before about the timing already, right? So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna pick a time. It feels to me like fall 2021 or spring 2022. Definitely, by, I think by 2022. But I also, I don't know. I mean, I don't know if we're going to be weird around every flu season now, which means that conferences and meetings are going to get pushed into the summer in, in you know, in the Northern Hemisphere and the opposite in the South. I don't know what's going to happen with our sort of the remnant germophobia that we're still going to have when mm-hmm. the epidemic itself is waning down. But I know that we are going to want to gather again. And what I hope is that a lot of organizations that realize there's cost savings to running themselves a little leaner with this work from anywhere. So we need less office space because people are here only uh, two thirds of the time. So we need two thirds less space. I hope we don't just look at that as a savings. I hope we look at it as let's pour that money into gatherings. Let's pour that money into meetings so that we can recreate that bonding and have it happen deeper um, smart, fully distributed companies have been doing that for 10 years now. And I hope as, mm-hmm. as companies move to this work from anywhere world, they invest some of the savings on their leases into those in-person meetings that actually build those bonds deeper. So it is possible to do it virtual. There's nothing like face-to-face. We know that because of the, the world we live in, right? Absolutely. Um, but it is, it is possible. And when you have no other option, you can do it. You just need to think about why those face-to-face meetings bonded so much and then find a way to build that back into what your team does on a day-to-day basis. Yeah, that's the thing. When you force, you force. There's no option. Um, when you have the choice, and again, if it's communications, something like that can go online. Uh, and, and to your point, not only people want to come back and, and see each other. I, I've seen it. I attended a few uh, few months ago. Uh, in November, the um, MPI World Education Conference in Grapevine, Texas, which was great. 
Uh, there was uh, 650 people uh, on site and uh, 1,100 online. Um, the the human being and the craving for a meeting is never going to go away. But I think that if I look at the previous crisis, uh, I remember Cisco, for instance, they switched their the big 15,000 people uh, sales meeting online, fully online, uh, one year. Uh, and and what happened is that uh, the next year they had an hybrid uh, mix, and the people that were performing the best were those who were uh, awarded the fact that they could attend. And that's yeah. what I think we're we're going to see. There is no better tool than face to face meeting, and and it's always the same. We say when we meet, we change the world. I truly, truly, truly believe that. And the point is, when you bring people together. You, you're able to create experiences that are unique, that are irreplaceable. But if you ask people, and that's the data shows that, there is a certain level uh, above which people are not necessarily motivated by earning a little bit more money. They want more experience. And don't get me wrong. If you cannot pay your, your bill at the end of the month, uh, don't send me to Bora Bora. I, I, I want to be able yeah. to pay my bills. But the motivation also comes from the face-to-face. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a great, uh, I think it's called the $30,000 gold star. That's all about um, people finagling their way uh, past a certain compensation point to win president's club so they can go to the trip, right? Even though they could structure the deals differently and win more compensation. Um, I mean, you're right. You're right. I, I will say, though, that please don't listen to everything we just said and and say, well, they say that there's nothing like face to face. So I'm going to call all my employees back five days a week. Like, there's nothing, there's nothing better than face-to-face. There's also nothing worse than face-to-face that's pointless, right? That didn't mm-hmm. actually need to happen, right? And so yeah. if, you're, if you're calling the meeting because you want to convey information. I mean, I, my first job out of, uh, out of college before I went back to graduate school, I worked in the pharmaceutical industry. And that was like the king industry of paying exorbitant amounts of money to get everyone together to read a slideshow at them for eight hours and then set them free at the Bellagio, right? Like that was the meat. And it was pointless. The the beauty that happens is the bonding piece that we talked about. And also when you get people together face to face to solve problems, to come up with ideas, it's possible to do it virtually, but we, that's one area we really do not have the technology for yet is how do you run kind of that, that whole creative process digitally. I'm not so sure you can do it compared to being able to run through that process uh, in a face to face environment. And so those are great reasons to give people information that could have been a video that they watch on your company's intranet is a bad reason to do it, right? So, so yes, there's nothing like those meetings, but let's, let's spend the time we're asking people to be present wisely because we, don't, we have much less of it now than we had before the pandemic. So we need to spend it much wisely, much, much more wisely. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. I always love listening to you, David. You're such a great mind. I love it. Where do you think that the future of work is headed? And what should we prepare ourselves to in terms of whether you're a leader in a large organization or you are a business owner? What can you do to prepare yourself for the future of work? Yeah, I mean, I think adaptability is probably the core skill. Um, It certainly was in 2020. Um, and, and when I say that, when I look at the firms that are the most adaptable, even since I wrote about this in Under New Management in 2016, the firms that have a much more fluid approach to their organizational chart. You know, a lot of times people think that the building block of my org chart is the job or is the person. And I don't know that, that that's not a very flexible Uh, It's not a very adaptable way to think about it. I think the building block of most organizations should be the project, right? And we hire people who have various knowledge, skills, and abilities, and then we put them on teams based on the project needs we have. A lot of trade associations, et cetera, the nonprofits that I work with when we're planning those meetings work that way beautifully, right? Um, But then a lot of other larger organizations, whether they have events teams or not, um, they have, there's very much a not my job syndrome because the org chart is built on the job instead of, hey, we need these people for this project. And so savvy companies have already been moving there. The interesting thing is, if you look at even the savviest firms that were building around the project, they were still usually assuming co-location mattered, right? So they were building around the project, but they would look around the 200 person San Francisco office and go, I need five people. Well, you don't actually need all five of them to be from San Francisco anymore. One can be from Rio de Janeiro and one can be from Australia, right? We've learned how to do that. 
So, you know, a continuation of the same in that regard, that moving from this mentality that the we need to or structure our organizations around projects, but now the team we put together in response to that project can be fully global, which is an ex- pretty, pretty much an exciting time. And by the way, we're at a point where it's never been easier to contract in that talent as well. So thinking beyond not just the flexible org chart, but thinking beyond the boundary of an organization. We saw firms like Upwork make a huge pivot even before the pandemic to serving corporate clients because they realized that that's going to be, you know, it used to be that when you think of outsourcing, freelancing, et cetera, you thought call centers or you thought like Fiverr.com. But now it can be sort of like, well, I need an accountant and I don't have enough work for a full-time $100,000 accountant, but I have 10 hours a week and now I can go to this place and get that talent that I need. That person's still a part of the team, but they're only part of the, right? So, so that, that flexibility as well. And if you haven't already flipped your mind to the way we organize our work needs to be around what projects are we undertaking, then all of this is gonna be difficult for you. But if you go through that mindset shift first, I think you're gonna have a much better chance adapting to whatever the future has in store. Wow. There's a lot of uh, great ideas. Um, and what I like with you is you're very straightforward. Like for instance, for those watching uh, this uh, podcast on YouTube, uh, when we started, you say, oh, you saw my, my setting and say, okay, it's it's not uh, video. I say, no, I need to improve all the video, David. Thank you very much for that. And as I'm watching myself disappear because the night is falling now in South Florida and you're still bright and shining <laughs> to the point, Adaptability, <laughs> my friend. Ah, nice. Very nice. Um, l- last question I'd like to ask you, and, and um, you, you rightly mentioned uh, the conference where we met. Uh, it's actually Mastermind Talk uh, by by the amazing Jason Gagnard. And, and Jason, if you listen, I think you're going to have a, a crack out of this. So I love the question that ap- apparently it's Clay Ebert who gave that question to Jason. Uh, yeah, but, I guess. But I, I always ask, and that's in my mind, uh, the, the Jason question is to ask uh, if we meet in one year from now with a bottle of champagne, what will we be celebrating? So when I prepare the podcast, it's one of the questions I ask. And there is one guy, <laughs> David Burkus, who answer, well, in one year, I wish to see more people adopting Jason Gagnard key question. <laughs> So my friend, in one year time, what's going to happen? Yeah, I, I mean, I'll, t- I'll tell you what would, uh, I'll, actually, I'll, I'll show you too, because I still have my lights on. And if you're listening to this on the podcast, I'll just describe it to you. But Eric, when I hold up this, what do you, what do you think of? Uh, stapling machine. No, so this is a, specifically, this is a red stapler. For those of you listening to the podcast, this is a red stapler. This is my stapler from Office Space, right? Okay. I keep this on my bookshelf. I look at it. It makes me laugh. It makes me think of the movie. If you haven't seen it, I'll send you to watch this weekend. You need to. But most, right, it's a movie about how dreadful most people's office life is, right? It's a, it's a, it's like Dilbert in a, in a feature film. And this is one of the running gags and it is the red stapler. I dream of a world where more people have the response you just had, which is I don't get the joke because they haven't seen the movie, because the movie's not funny to them, because their experience of work isn't dreadful. And so one year from now, if we've got a bottle of champagne, we are celebrating that fewer people find movies like Office Space or shows like The Office or comics like Dilbert funny because it doesn't resonate with them anymore because they have a much better experience of work. Awesome. David, uh, once again, congratulations on your uh, four and a half, fifth book, (laughs) Uh, that is coming out today on Amazon, Leading from Anywhere, The Essential Guide to Managing Remote Team. I'm glad I pre-ordered it already, so I don't have to do it today. Thank you so much for taking the time to speaking with me today. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Thank you, David, for joining me on the Business of Meeting podcast. And I love your point you're making about the culture and how you build a culture now that uh, people will continue uh, to work uh, at least some of the days remotely and speaking about the share understanding, the share identity and the psychological psychological safety. So thanks a lot uh, for joining me on the podcast. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you want to join me on the Facebook group so we can talk and continue to talk about the business of meetings, you can do so by going to www.eventbusinessformula.com group. 
and you can definitely link up with me on LinkedIn. Thank you.